All righty. So, well, um, if you want to go ahead and press record, Catherine, I'll just do a quick announcement here for you and then we can get started, okay? All right, go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Catherine. She is part of a quarter cultural, I'm sorry, horticultural specialist group that works with the Laramie County College. And she's here today to talk to us about some of the fun plants that grow here in Cheyenne. So without further ado, Catherine, if you'd like to take it away. Okay, great. Well, again, my name is Catherine Wisner, and I'm with the University of Wyoming, Laramie County Extension Office, which is based here in Cheyenne. And normally my office would be located at the community college, but you know, a lot of us are working from home and that's where I'm at. So I'm going to go through some of the plants that grow here in bloom and uh, so some pretty pictures of flowers I guess and some stuff that I'm seeing out on the prairie. I do live out in Carpenter, Wyoming and so I have access to a lot of prairie and I like to hike around out there and take pictures. And then I'll talk a little bit uh, about some of the fun stuff that comes into my office and questions. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen. So you find us a lot of stuff here. And we'll get going. And all right, here we go. So now if you have any questions as we go along, that's Great, and I welcome those questions. And you can just interrupt, ask Lauren or ask me, and, and I'll answer your questions. So, again, the title is What's Blooming in Laramie County, and it's just sort of a thumbnail snapshot of what I'm seeing. So, one of the challenges, as you probably all know, is growing in Cheyenne or Laramie County, we're at 6,000 feet in elevation. We're really always in a drought. We, we never have a lot of moisture here. And the average annual moisture is anywhere from nine inches, that's a bad year, to 13 to 15 inches. 15 inches is a really good year for us. So 15 inches of moisture is not a lot. So whatever is planted has got to be pretty tough and hardy. So that's why we're always in a drought. And by comparison, at some place like, like um, Lincoln, Nebraska, for example, we get close to 30 inches of moisture a year. 30 inches, so almost a yardstick worth of moisture. That's why there's so much greener, more humidity, more bugs. So the advantage of a dry environment is we just don't have the insect problems, we don't have problems bacteria problems. So we don't have a lot of those problems, but we do have other other issues. One of those is the wind. <laughs> I don't have to tell anybody, you know, the wind always blows here and and sometimes it can be pretty daunting. Or winters are cold and dry. Not a lot of moisture in that snow. I do um, keep track of snow moisture and I report it. And and I can tell you that there's just not a lot there. If we get a tenth of an inch of moisture, that's about an inch of snow, so the snow does not hold a lot of water. And then the other thing is where the USDA, United States Department of Ag, keeps keeps trying to tell us we're a zone five. Well, we're not. We're zone four. And we're zone four because of all the things we just talked about. You know, the soil pH is alkaline. You know, we, you never want to lime the soil in the western United States, it's already full of more lime and that's kind of a problem. And so we have a lot of things that are challenging to us for trying to grow things. So I've learned over the years, um, part of my job with the Laramie County Extension Office is I teach the Master Gardener program. And I have learned Sometimes the hard way to never say never, especially to someone who's taking the Master Gardener program, that something won't grow here. Because as soon as I say that, I got a Master Gardener that raises their hands and go, I'm growing it and it's doing okay. So we do have a, a nice choice of 
beautiful wild flowers, domestic flowers, trees and shrubs that can grow here. And on the prairie, it's just an amazing diversity of flowering plants. And sometimes you really have to kind of go out there and hunt for them. You have to know where to go hunt for them because they like to hide and, and stay in, in certain areas that support them. So I'm going to cover the first part of this. I'm going to cover is, is kind of what's blooming in my yard. Or I got a couple of best gardeners who donated pictures for me. So we'll just take a quick tour and, and see what's going on out there. This little guy started to grow it because there was so much confusion over the, the botanical name, or the, excuse me, the common name, Pearly Everlasting. Well, there's a couple of other flowering plants that are called Pearly Everlasting, but this is the real one. And this tiny, delicate little white flowers, and as it, as it grows, as it gets bigger, this here sprouts up a little bit higher. It takes on a, a yellow hue to it. So it's really very delicate, very dainty, and it just the whole shrub will be covered in these little pearly everlasting flowers. The shrub itself doesn't get very big. It's 18 inches tall. It does like to creep. Didn't say that in the book, but it does like to creep. And, it went from a little clump that was maybe 12 inches and it's now about 36 inches so it does like to creep but it's just tough and hardy and takes a lot of a lot of abuse it just keeps on coming back every year so i'm really happy with this guy and this columbine i mean this is kind of like the quintessential rocky mountain flower and it comes in so many different colors. It's, it's a, there comes in a sky blue, a dark purple, a medium blue. There's red ones, yellow ones. It just comes in a whole host of colors. This one will also kind of self-seed and scatter itself around and start popping up in places you didn't know you planted. So it's kind of fun when they do that. But this one likes to have a little cooler, more moist soil. A little shade. I've seen them grow in full sun. I've seen them grow in full shade. This guy is in part sun, part shade. So in the afternoon, it gets a little bit more shade. So he's he's pretty dapper and it adds a lot of beauty. And I get hummingbirds, hummingbirds. Love this guy. See, it's a it requires something that's very long tongue in order to take advantage of the winter. Each one of these little openings here uh, responds to this, and down there is the reward of nectar. And so the hummingbirds, this is really designed for hummingbirds. Once in a while, I'll see a little bee, a little tiny native bee crawl down in there and take a sip. Sometimes I'll see honey bees bite off, literally, to a hole, bite off part of this flower and steal the nectar. Kind of cheating. Blue eyed grass. This guy is double duty. Not very big. Only blooms for a couple of weeks in the spring. It is a native wildflower that has been domesticated and now grows in, in gardens. Does very well. And then when the flowers come up, when these, these little Dainty blue flowers drop off, it looks just like grass. And, and so it, it will camouflage other things, it'll help support other, other plants. But just a, a very dainty, delicate, pretty little spring reward. And it does attract native bees. The native bees do like these guys, so that works out very well. Helps, helps them. This one is um, red feathers. This is a very drought tolerant, very tough, durable plant. I've, it does occasionally self seed and I've dug it up and transplanted to get a taproot so it's not real happy about being transplanted. And it rewards me with these just beautiful flowers. Red, it, red is, this is the only color it comes in. And it has a wild cousin that uh, does escape and has problems with. But this is a domesticated wildflower, and it's pretty well behaved. Tough as nails, 
doesn't get very big, maybe maybe 18 inches. I think I've seen some in some of the Master Gardener's yards that are pretty good size. But this guy is, is kept small, and it's finest in my, my rock garden, uh, a, a dry kind of rock garden area, and it does very, very well in it. Jumped around a little bit. I've moved him around. This is prickly pear, and I have transplanted some of them, and it have, they have just this pathetic little root system, and I just, I don't even know how they survive out, out in the prairie. But it, this is so pretty. This is such a lovely yellow, just a very happy, friendly yellow, just sunny. So it's really quite a nice addition to the garden. And, and they can get big. I've seen them down in, uh, in the Texas area, and, and they're huge, huge. Fortunately, up here, they don't get very big, but something that grows in the prairie, um, easy to put in your garden, carefully. This is Himalayan sage. This guy, again, does double duty. And I've, I'm growing mine in shade, shady area and he's doing very well. Rewards me with these just outstanding pinkish white flowers and then you can see right here I got a big old bumblebee that is enjoying a she's enjoying a big meal a nectar meal. They can grow in full sun, they can tolerate dry soils, they can tolerate moist soils. So they're they're really a very versatile, easy care, easy going flower, and they are, as the name implies, Himalayan. They're not native to Wyoming. <laughs> they they are from Eurasia. They do very well here. This guy's been in my garden for about five years now. Never had a bit of problems with it. No bugs. Nothing. And, the bees, the bees just love this flower. So that's that's a nice reward for me is to be able to feed the bees. Red cloud spiderwort, Tradesantia. This one comes in also blue, and sometimes it'll jump around. Sometimes it'll self seed and show up in other places. It flowers predominantly in the cool of the morning, cool of the afternoon. And when it gets hot out, it closes up. And so it's kind of, you got a morning person to want to enjoy this guy because that's really where you're going to see it. But what a lovely color of flower. It just really glows in this particular garden. And in this location, it gets morning shade, fairly moist area, and then full afternoon sun. It does beautifully for me. Kind of Almost looks like long blades of grass. This is another companion plant for this one. We let it get daylily. Daylily will go beautifully with this. And the two colors will complement each other nicely. Again, another another plant that's very versatile. It'll grow in a hotter, drier location. It gets about 24 inches tall. So again, it doesn't get overwhelming in the garden. So just a nice, well-behaved perennial border plant. This one is new for me. This one is a mullein. And most people know mullein as a weed. And, and the wild mullein that blooms yellow it can get really tall. You get about five, six feet tall. And it's considered a, a noxious weed that needs to be eradicated. But this is a more domesticated mullein. And mullein comes in a whole bunch of different sizes, shapes, colors, flavors. And this one's called 50 Wedding Candles. And so at the base here, it'll start sprouting out just dozens of these little flower spikes. And I looked at one in, in one of my master gardeners gardens, and it was huge, and it just it lived up to its name, 50 Wedding Candles. Again, it likes to hot, dry, doesn't get a lot of water. It's unfortunately not long lived. It's, a, it's what we call a biannual. So last year when it was in my garden, it was just green leaves, big, big, huge leaves. And this year it put up a flowering spike and it'll seed, it'll go to seed 
help capture some of those seeds and replant it. But otherwise, it's it's a two-year plant, which, you know, I like, I like them coming back year after year and looking better every year. But anyway, this is just a two-year plant. This is a Veronica, and Veronica is a big family of flowers. And this happens to be a Veronica that's, that's a creeping low ground cover. And this one only gets about three inches tall at the most. And this one's called Water Perry Blue. Blooms all summer. It starts blooming in the spring and it will go until a frost tells it to stop. It has a peak bloom season in May and June, and then it just kind of repeat blooms throughout the season, but not quite as showy as it did initially. But just a very nice round cover. And so when you, when you do a landscape, you start off with your low guys and then you move up to higher and higher. And so this makes a really good plant for that foreground. So this is another shade lover. And, and actually I've, I've grown this guy in the shade like it was grown at my parents' house for a while and it got full afternoon sun. Hot, dry, and it did fine. <clears throat> it does like a little bit more moisture, a little bit more water. It's about 12 inches tall and it's an herb. It's a perennial herb. And this guy has been used historically, these flowers, to season a white wine, a German white wine, and it's a it's a May wine is the name of it. And it's a it's a very light, crisp, refreshing wine and it's seasoned with uh, sweet woodruff. And so sweet woodruff is an herb. You have a little native because the native flowers are great. It creeps along, it gets bigger up here, and it just kind of goes where it wants to, but it, it follows the shade and moist soil. So just a real nice filler, nice filling plant. Pretty green color. Doesn't have a lot of problems. I don't ever have a lot of bug and insect problems with it. And so it's a pretty durable guy. So creeping baby's breath. Baby's breath comes in a whole bunch of different sizes and it comes either in white, blue white, or pink. So I think that's great. I think I love baby's breath as a flower. It's just a wonderful addition to my garden. Tiny little delicate pink flowers. Only gets maybe eight inches tall, maybe. It's another low growing. It's another front of the border, low growing. Works well in a rock and crevice garden. You kind of fit in a little mix of crannies. So it's it's just a very sweet addition into my garden, the flower bed. And doesn't get if I can way. ask Catherine, sure. how large is your personal garden? Or do you have a shared garden that you got some of these pictures from with your master gardeners program? Some of them are most almost all of these are coming from either my garden or the brewery I live on. And I, I live on just a little over two hundred acres. And so but my my cultivated garden I have a bunch of little cultivated gardens all throughout the property. And and so I've manipulated um, areas and I've I've added plants behind them to create shade. So I've created a couple shade gardens. I have um, a water birch growing on my in one of my gardens and several roses. So it, it's all how you, I mean, you can change your environment just by the plants you put in. And so I've got um, naking cherries, which have gotten eight feet tall. And so in front of them, I've created a shade garden and, and that's, that's done very well. So I've gotten a lot of stuff going. So, so yeah, this is all off my personal property. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. That's fine. I'd, I'd much rather have a little more interactive than just me babbling away. I, I have master gardeners who've got gardens that just do circles around me. And I was at one last week and it, it was spectacular. We could have spent the whole day just walking around and, and talking about the plants. And 
And I've got a couple of master gardeners where their yards look like something that just came out of Better Homes and Gardens. It's, it's just crazy. So, so Cheyenne has got some pretty amazing gardeners. And I just, I just sort of add guidance. <laughs> there's well, I think with all the weather and all the challenges that you talked about being a gardener here in Cheyenne, it uh, can definitely be difficult to, you know, start and uh, have a good garden. But I'm, I'm glad that we have a, a wonderful group of people here who are dedicated to the task. Yeah, there's a, there's probably 400 master gardeners in Laramie County, and oh, wow. there's, there's quite a, there's quite a, a force out there of gardeners, and, and it's, it's a lot of fun, absolutely. And some of these plants have been given to me by master gardeners. And like, here, try this. <laughs> See how you do it. Um, is this, this guy is... Um, um, we did have a that? question here. We did have a question from a resident. Uh, she asked if this plant is also known as silver sage. The one that we got up right now? Yes. Or are they different um, plants? Well, let's see. This one, this is a salvia. And so salvia is often referred to as sage. And it's not a true sage. So it's, it, it, so that, it makes it a little confusing. But it could, but you can call sa salvia sage. And out in California, they have huge swaths of salvia, aka sage and they get a lot of honey off of those plants but this is one called silver sage and it's a salvia and just i tried to do my best to take in a close-up of these flowers and, and you can see they're, they're designed for bee to come in and then and then the flower deposits its pollen on the back of the bee and then the bee goes to another flower and it's it's pretty cool how it's managed to make you know do this adaptation for pollen transfer. Beautiful flower, almost orchid like, just absolutely orchid like. This one, um, peak flowering was end of Ju end of June. It's still flowering a little bit, but not quite as impressive. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a. Uh, Kind of what I have for flowers right now, but I have had a couple of very unusual visitors, and I had a black witch moth show up in my lambing barn, and walked in a couple mornings ago, and this thing is huge. This is six inch wide moth, and I stopped and looked at it, and was I, my first thought was I got to get my camera. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran back, I took a whole bunch of pictures, hoped for the best, and, and a black witch moth in some culture, it's, it's not a common, but it's not uncommon moth, and in some cultures, especially the Caribbean, they consider this a good luck. If a black moth, black witch moth shows up in your home, it's considered good luck. And, and then there's some other cultures that get a little freaked out over it. But I'd like to, I'd like to lean towards the, the more positive side of this. And I thought it was just beautiful. Didn't stay very long. Came back a couple hours later and, and this big old moth had taken off. But six inches from, from here all the way over to there, big. It was it was almost the size it was the size of some of the birds that I see around here. So from that guy to this one, this is the Ivy Line. Oh, we have a question here, Catherine. Catherine, we do have a question. Okay. Is it, we've got a question. Yeah. All right. About the black witch moth. Um, is it because of climate change that it's moving this way? No, it's, it's actually found here. It, it's kind of a migratory moth, and they've documented them as far north as, as Canada, all the way down to the Caribbean, up to California, 
they're, they like it a little bit drier, so they eat a little Caribbean. But um, they're kind of a Western United States guy. So he, it, it's, I just happened to be lucky at that exact moment that that moth showed up. I happened to be there. It was meant to be so was, for today. Yeah, it was meant to be. And I think it was just very cool. <laughs> it was very, very cool. <laughs> But yeah, no, that's it, it has nothing to do with climate change. It just my timing was finally good. Yep. It's kind of like my timing was good with this guy too. I hope you guys can see the color. This is a bright mint green and tiny, an inch, an inch, huge, just a little tiny thing. And he was on the screen of my my house and I took a quick picture or two or three <laughs> and uh and then he disappeared but they're they're not uncommon in flower garden and, and so what a cool what a beautiful addition to a flower garden is this beautiful emerald moth is beautiful so i was i really felt quite privileged to have it with the right moments to catch in this so what's blooming on the prairie it, it, the prairie is just this world of wonder out there, and there's so much going on, and it just kind of breaks my heart when I see people mow the prairie, because they're just destroying this very unique ecology, and, and you know, the myth that goes along with the prairie is just so off base, and the more you mow it, the, the more it dies, and so, so mowing is death to the and, and I don't mow any of my prairie. I'm very care, careful with grazing it even. So here's what I'm seeing on the prairie. Hopefully some fun stuff here. This is June grass. And this grass just shimmers. It just absolutely shimmers this yellow gold color. And there's not a lot of it. It's just kind of a little clump here and there on the prairie. And it's an annual. And it'll self so you can see it's got like a gazillion seeds on it. So it'll self seed, and hopefully I'll see it next year. But what a what a beautiful little grass. Not very big, maybe maybe eight inches, maybe ten inches tall. So again, just a tiny guy. None of the grass on our prairie ever really gets tall. You know, in a good year, we'll see maybe two feet in height on the grass and that, that includes the seed head. So the prairie never gets very tall. This is Oxytropus lambertii. So I tease my master gardeners when I, when I do a program and I've got um, some of the genus species names included and it's like there'll be a pronunciation test at the end. <laughs> so this is Oxytropus lambertii. This is your local weed and there's a couple others that get confused for local weed, and, and one of them is astragalus. But this is um, this one grows more upright, and this can get pretty darn tall. This can get 18 inches, 24 inches tall, the, the flowering portion of it. And so all parts of this, you know, if an animal eats it, especially horses, um, and the end results aren't aren't always very good. And then I have, um, where I live, Crow Creek runs through my property. And so that creates a whole new environment and ecology and you know, a whole new worlds of wonder out there. But this is a ranuncula, and this is a water buttercup. And it forms these mats, and it's almost like algae, but it's, it's not, it's a, it's a true plant. And it forms these pretty little white flowers and bumblebees, native bees. I had some of my honey, my uh, honey bees were out there taking advantage of this. But it likes that water. It wants that cool, um, fairly. It likes the water to move. You can put this, you know, if you have your own pond or pool, you can plant. But it does like water to circulate. And it can get really dense. I, I came across some really, really dense mats of this. 
So that was pretty pretty cool. But what a beautiful little five petal flower and you know the yellow stamens in the middle, just very nice. So this is um, a rumax, and this grows along roadsides. And this um, this again blooms. It blooms in June, late May, June, and kind of the flowers are more like bracts, but it's just a really pretty salmon color. Sometimes I'll see them more red, sometimes it'll be more more pink, but just a really pretty little wildflower. Again, they, they like that disturbed soil along um, the roadsides if the road's been graded or the road's been graded or um, a new construction site, this guy will sometimes pop up. Um, all these are little seeds in there, so it, it can be a little prolific. Seems to be fairly herbicide resistant. The county comes out and sprays the sides of the road. And I, I've never seen them take this guy out, so that's that's kind of that's okay. Penstemon. This guy is beautiful, sky blue. And I've got some growing in my garden, but I don't have any that are even come close to what is, is out in the prairie. And again, this is another one that the native bees and the honeybees just love, but the native bees really like this guy. And this, one, this really supports that native bee habitat well. Likes it dry, sandy, gravelly soil. I mean, you can see this is not the best soil down here. So it's pretty adaptable, easy care, easy care, like easy care plants, right? So we're, we're in a drought this year. This is right in the beginning of a, of a drought. And so this is not very tall. This was only about eight inches. I have seen them, I've seen them a foot and a half tall in a, in a good year. Thermops. Um, this is a, a member of the pea, fam the pea family. And so this is um, Thermopsis rhombifolia. And bright yellow. I mean, the sun just grows bright yellow flowers. And it's, a, it's found in the legume family. Not, it makes nice flower arrangement, but it's not something that um, animals will eat. It's kind of deer resistant in that respect. Little delicate violets, a couple of different colors out of the prairie. And it just happened to be the right spot, the right moment, lucky to take this picture of this, this guy blooming yellow. I've got some out there that are, are the common purple colors. So this was quite the treat to come across this violet. This was in a little cooler, more moist soil. So when people mow their prairie, they make their prairie hotter and drier. And so wildflowers like this guy can't survive in that at all, and they just die out and go away. So I I very careful with how I. Take care of my prairie. I don't overgraze it. I never mow it, and, and so I have a, a very nice wildflower diversity. But this guy, um, a little cooler, a little bit more moist soil. Oh, woody aster. So this is um, <laughs> so this one's a tough one for me. Xylothea. These are. Flower rose. Anyway, it's <laughs> a tough one. Woody Aster is much easier. This one is um, very low growing. It can get away, it can kind of take over some areas. This is one I'll have to watch and make sure that it doesn't um, become noxious or obnoxious. And it's also, um, unfortunately, I raise sheep. So when I'm not being Laramie County Extension Horticulturist, I'm a sheep herder. And so this one is toxic to sheep, so I do watch this one closely. Um, tiny, maybe maybe eight inches tall at the most, so it doesn't get very big, but it will spread. 
So when you see the prairie all glow in yellow, and it's a taller yellow, it's a, it's a darker, deeper yellow, that is going to be the wallflower. And very prevalent throughout the prairie, um, does well with hot, dry, sandy soils, does well in moisture, it's very adaptable. But just a, a really cheerful yellow. So it, this is comes up in May, and I've seen it come up a little earlier, but uh, this is predominantly a May bloomer, and some of it's still blooming out now. So I also do yard calls, and people will call me up and say, you know, would you come look at my my tree or shrub or lawn? So I have a couple of couple of fun ones. So these are these are fun fun outtakes from some of the stuff I see. And so he sent me this picture on email. This is my mother-in-law keeps finding these in her yard. She has no idea where they are coming from and says they're hard like coral. And I looked at it and I said, it looks like bread. She goes, no, they're hard like coral. They're hard. I said, are you sure? She goes, no, I think it's a mole. <laughs> So I sent the picture to a friend of mine at UW, and he came back and he said, it's like a cinnamon roll. <laughs> it turns out the neighbor kid would pick up the, the frosting on top and some of the cinnamon and throws it over the fence into this lady's yard. <laughs> so so the, the alien cinnamon roll, hardest coral mystery solved. <laughs> Then I got this sent to me. I've never seen such a thing. I've done some online searching and came up blank. Well, so this is kind of one of those pictures where you gotta look at it. But if you see the, the shadows over here, these long finger-like shadows, and if you look at this closely, you can also see these finger-like protrusions. Well, this is a, a midge, a little tiny insect that's, that's biting on the leaf, and it genetically changes the DNA of the leaf to form these galls, and the midge lays its eggs in there, and then that's where it's kind of like a little, little house for the midge, and then the midge hatches out and flies away. The shadows really, I thought, were pretty cool. <laughs> And so what was the bug called? A midge. M-I-D-G-E. A midge. Little tiny things. I mean, those are those no sims. Little tiny guy. So I also like to tour through the big box stores to see what corporate America is sending to Cheyenne, Wyoming. And this was the tag on a tree they were trying to sell. Maturity varies. So you don't even know how big this tree is going to get. Is it 10 feet? 20 feet? 50? So you don't know. Space varies. So you don't even know where to plant it. You don't want to plant it near your house. Hardiness. It really helps to know the hardiness of a plant you're buying. And so they've changed, the corporations have changed these tags. And so you, you no longer really know if it's appropriate plant for your area. And when all it says is the hardiness varies, I mean, you, you, you don't know if it's something you should buy or not. And, and so when I tell you we're really a zone four, that means plants need to go to minus 30. Minus 30. So winter is always your worst case scenario. And I've been through Wyoming winters where they were minus 45. And so the plants have got to be pretty darn durable and tough. But, but how, how do you know? I think this is incredible disservice to the buying, to the consumer. Incredible disservice. So not to be outdone, another big box store was selling an Atlas Cedar or Cedrus Atlantica. This should be a big clue, Atlantica. So this is a plant, you know, it doesn't even tell you what kind of soil it wants. 
you know, we have a we have a cold, dry, alkaline soil in Wyoming, and so you really have to be careful with what you plant. And it's not a one size fits all zone either, because some of the zone four is very acidic and moist, and so not one. It's not a one size fits all. But if you if you notice, if you read read through this, it says care, apply mulch. Apply mulch to where? Huh. Size, this is gonna be big. This is 40 to 60 feet tall by 20 to 40 feet wide. Now, at least they're giving you an idea how big this is gonna get, right? This is, this little plant in the pots is, is that St. Bernard. They do advise to give you 25 feet space, pyramidal habitat, but here's the real, real clincher. Hardiness to minus 10, minus 10. <laughs> in Cheyenne, Wyoming, this makes it an annual. This is a tree that one of the big box stores was selling, and this is an annual. This is not a perennial, this is not gonna last. If we have a mild winter, it'll last a year. But minus 10, it is not going to survive Wyoming. <laughs> That's just that's just sad. I, I hate to see the consumers taken advantage of like that. So I was, here's a question that came in to me. I was planning on trying to do a raised bed garden. I had some soil delivery. It's stinky. It's not like an earthly compost. It smells more like sewage. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> I talked a little bit more to somebody on where it came from. He said it was from a swampy area, a drainage area. No, heavy metals, who knows what else. I guess my concern is I want to garden with it and I wasn't sure if it was safe for me and my family. If it's stinky, it's it's an anaerobic bacteria, and, and I would be really concerned about putting my hands in it or raising vegetables in it. I told him just to spread it out on his lawn and, and where to go buy some good soil. Gary, smells more like sewage. So, <laughs> I, with this whole COVID thing, there's... Everybody seems like they want to get into vegetable gardening and, and grow a vegetable garden for themselves because they're concerned about food and food shortages. So I'm raising a, ra I'm starting a raised garden for the first time and would like some help learning about what vegetables would be best to grow. So my answer is, what do you like to eat? <laughs> grow what you like to eat. If you don't like turnips, don't grow turnips. No. <laughs> So it, it's, it's always interesting, and it's never dull. It is never, my job is not dull. It's never dull. <laughs> it's always interesting. And these are my new office co-workers here. <laughs> oh. A very tolerant cat. <laughs> 18-month-old corgi who doesn't care. So... That's the end of my show. I'm going to stop sharing here and go back. Well, I think at this point, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, I'll let the ladies think about if they have anything they would like to ask. But I did also have a question for you. Sure, go ahead. Um, I know that you said there's about over 400 uh, master gardeners here in Cheyenne, right? Yep. Do any, do you or any in particular do anything like plant walks? I see some of them go on down in Denver, you know, where they can take people down and kind of show them what types of plants are growing and things of that nature. Well, under, under a normal year, we would do an annual garden walk. And we'll find four, five, six different gardens. And the master gardeners go into the, you know, and it's, this is a, a private homeowner that is now volunteering their yard to be toured by the general public. And the master gardeners will go in there, they'll tidy it up, they'll label the plants, 
And um, one year we had um, um, musicians at each garden. Sometimes they'll have art at the gardens that's for sale. But nor normally we would do something like that, have a, an annual garden walk. We have an annual Michigan or plant sale and garden show. In, in a normal year, we're holding it out in Arthur, which is the new fairgrounds, and we're holding it in a multi purpose building, which is huge, um, big, beautiful, air conditioned. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, not Kay. Um, Catherine, it, it's a little hard to hear your mic. I don't know if you're covering it with your hand, so. <laughs> no, I'm go sorry. Um, okay, there you go. Okay, I, yeah, I, my mic hasn't moved. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, we have. We also have the annual garden show out at Archer, and that's huge, absolutely huge. Lots of huge diversity of annual and perennials, especially the perennials, um, vegetables. We have vendors. Hopefully, we'll have it. You know, the real one next year. We did an online version this year. Yeah, we we try to do some outreach into the public. We've got some. Um, legacy projects that we've done. We have a master gardener that landscapes the columbarium at the Pine Bluff Cemetery. We've done a lot of little projects throughout Cheyenne and of course um, the Botanic Gardens. We've um, done quite a few projects out there. The High Plains Research Station has got an arboretum out there labeled trees. So so there's a lot of stuff going on, but you know, unfortunately this year there won't be a garden tour, sadly. Yeah. Well, well, unfortunately this year has been something different for all of us, but uh, maybe next year we'll certainly have some more opportunities. But we do have some questions here, Catherine. So okay. I'll turn it over to Miss Jean. Our family wants to plant trees on their 450 acre property that we've just invested, Cheyenne. Uh, what is the best time to plant? And uh, does the county supply these uh, trees? So, so when is the best time? Were you able to hear that pretty well? Um, so is, when is the best time to plant trees? Is that kind of what I get? Yes. Okay. Um, traditionally, spring is really the best time, but but the key the key factor, the most important factor. I mean, you can plant a tree any time as long as the ground isn't frozen. But the most important thing is keeping it watered. And a newly planted tree needs to be watered every other day. And that's, that's probably the most important thing you can do is, is keep that water to it. Even if you've planted it in August, the water is just so critical. And I just planted five evergreen trees. I'm watering them every other day. The trees I planted last year, I'm, plant, I'm still watering them two to three times a week. And, and so keeping that, that wood wall moist is so important. I put a mulch on, on the over the roots, so not I'm not mulching the stem. I'm mulching the roots, right? So I want to hold the moisture in. And so mulching is really important. Um, so there's a rule of thumb for watering a tree, and and that rule is for every inch of trunk diameter, it's ten gallons of water. So if you just planted a tree that's only two inches wide, and you measure that from the ground up a foot, and at that point, if it's two inches wide, that's 20 gallons of water. And, and every other day. And I know that seems like a lot, but it's hot, it's dry, it's windy right now, and it just sucks the moisture right out of that tree. And so you've got to stay on top of the watering. Very, very important. And some trees are better than others. Aspens and cottonwoods are just horrible from water usage. They just need tons and tons of gallons and gallons of water. And then they still don't do well. So I don't, 
on my list of don't plant is cottonwoods and aspens. Because they're not happy. They're just not happy where we plant them. Lauren, any other questions? <laughs> Um, she wanted to ask, does the county provide any trees if you're to plant trees? So if you live on the county, if you get a hold of the Laramie County Conservation District, they will come out and design a windbreak for you. And then for a nominal fee, they will plant it for you. And I highly recommend that you get them to plant it because what they can do in two hours will take you two weeks. And so the Laramie County Conservation District will do windbreaks. And then at the end of their, they always do, um, you know, they just sell these little conservation sticks that are, you know, a foot tall. Um, but when they have extra trees, they do sell those extra ones. And so you can buy them in the conservation district. And you can find the conservation district in the phone book. Perfect, thank you. Is there any other questions? Uh, she's asking what about the Arbor Foundation? Do, do they still supply trees? Yeah, you can still buy trees from um, the Arbor Day Foundation. Yeah, they still sell stuff. They, they, they do sell us stuff that is not the best for Wyoming. You know, blue spruce, and we all love the Colorado blue spruce, but they just, they're very water needy tree. They like to be along streams. You know, think of blue spruce and aspens together. Cool, moist soil, they like a lot of water. Hot, dry, windy prairie, not, not necessarily their happy place. Yeah. So a little bit more variety of the conservationists then. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, ladies, does anybody else have any other questions? Thank you very much. They said no, but they certainly enjoyed it and said thank you very much. All right. Well, anytime you have questions or want to try to get a hold of me, Lauren's got my email address and knows how to get in touch with me. So I'm always available, and like I said, I do yard calls. So if you know someone that's got trees or lawns or shrubs or whatever, vegetable gardens, I, she just I, might do a miracle for your plant. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Catherine. Well, thank you very much. Um, if you would like to, at this point, you can go ahead and uh, end the recording. And then I did have a question from an employee who would like to talk with you afterwards. So. Okay. I'm, I'm available. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, ladies, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day.